Hello and a very warm welcome to The Real Home Show. Coming up, how to create your dream kitchen extension. We put toasters for every budget to the test. Getting the mid-century modern look on a shoestring. The lowdown on voice assistance. Plus, we're giving away £1,000 to spend at Best Heating. If you're dreaming of a bigger kitchen, then grab a cuppa and prepare to be inspired as our small space squad visits a recently completed extension to explain how you can plan, design and budget a project of your own. Today we're in Leamington visiting this lovely 1930s semi which belongs to Ruth Focard and her husband. Now like many of us, they got fed up of having lots of small separate rooms downstairs in their home and decided to extend their kitchen to create that open plan living space that so many of us crave. Now if you're thinking of doing something similar, Jason and I have rounded up the five key things that you need to know before you begin. So first up, for most people, a good starting figure to work to is around £2,000 per square metre plus fat. But the real answer, I'm afraid, is that it depends. It depends on where you live in the country, what you put in the kitchen extension itself, not least how much that kitchen's gonna cost, of course, and how you work with a builder and loads of other things too. Now, some people come in significantly under 2,000 pounds a square meter, and some come in loads over. But if you allow that figure, you'll have a pretty decent idea of whether you can afford to go ahead or not. Secondly, the new space needs to suit your lifestyle. Now you might have seen a hundred kitchen extension pictures on Pinterest and they all have a sofa, a dining table and an island, but what will you actually use? So if you're done with dinner in 20 minutes, would you be better off with a breakfast bar instead of a formal dining table? Do you want a TV or is this a family space where you're not going to allow tech? And if you've got kids, do you need space for toys and homework? Once you have a list of four or five things that you want to be able to do in your new space, for example, have the whole family around for Christmas dinner, or simply sit and look out at your garden while you watch TV, then you'll have a much better idea of what the finished design should look like and you'll be able to brief your builder more clearly. So third up, you don't necessarily need a designer. Now my view is because the thing that most of us really worry about most isn't the design, actually most of these projects are quite similar, it's the costs, the process and the engineering. Now those things are influenced much more by the builder than a designer. Identify good builders early on and pivot the projects around them. Now search on tradesperson finding websites in the FMB and get a long list of builders in your area who claim to do extensions. Call them up and half probably won't be interested, and of those that are, speak to them in person and weed out the ones that you don't feel you can trust, a bit like dating. Then get recommendations and do background checks on the ones that you sweet on. It's critical, a good builder is the essential part of a good project. Fourth, you need to think carefully about light and flow. So if you extend the rear of your home by two or three meters, then you're moving the natural light source two or three meters further away from the heart of your home. To counteract this, you need to look at new ways that you can bring in light. Now the beauty of a single storey extension is that the new roof is the perfect way to introduce this through roof lights like these ones, or even a larger roof lantern. The new exterior wall of the extension can also help maximise daylight if you opt for some bifold or sliding doors with nice slim frames. Then you need to think about flow. So how will you use the existing rooms of the house and what's their purpose going to be once you have your new space? So it could be that your new extension will become your family's day space and that means your previous living room needs to be redecorated into a snug and that will become your evening space. Finally, it'll take two to three months to complete. After you've arranged the design and lined up a builder, it's important to ensure you've got planning permission if you need it. Now, most of these projects actually won't, and building regulations approval. All of these projects will. Them, insurance and warranties. Now, your normal home insurance won't cover the work, so look to a specialist provider like Self Build Zone to ensure you're covered. Only then can the building commence. The nice thing about kitchen extensions is that the initial work's external, so a good half of the work can be done before knocking into the existing house, where the external walls are replaced with steelwork, as you can see here. And then it's a case of the tradespeople, electricians, plumbers, plasterers and so on, working together to get the space complete before joinery, kitchen fitting, decorating and tiling. So there you have it, the five things you need to consider carefully before extending your kitchen. Join us next time when we'll be taking a tour of bungalow renovation and explaining how you can tackle a similar project. For more detail on extending, including everything you need to know about planning permission and building regulations, head to realhomes.com. Now it's time for me to put toasters for every budget to the test so that you know how much you need to spend when yours needs replacing. 
Join me afterwards for tips on introducing mid-century style to your home. There's nothing quite like a lovely slice of toast slathered in butter. But if you're anything like me, you've probably struggled to find a toaster that actually delivers an evenly sliced piece of toast that you can easily pick out. So today, we're gonna put three toasters to the test, and they come from all price points. So here on my left, we've got Asda's two slice toaster, just nine pounds, so a real bargain. We've then got the Russell Hobbs Inspire two slice toaster, which comes in at 34.99. And here at our expense, end we've got the Dualit light in white gloss and that comes in at hundred pounds obviously you have got your four slices with that one so what we're gonna do we're gonna pop in a slice of white bread first of all see how quickly they toast and also whether we get an even brown all of them for fairness have been set to the middle of their browning dial so let's see how they get on Okay, that's our last one come up. So the fastest toaster in the West Midlands was the Russell Hobbs, which came in at two minutes 20, which I think is reasonable for a medium sliced piece of toast. Next up was the Dualit, which came in four seconds later, and then lagging behind a bit, two minutes 40, was the George Home one from Asda. So that's how fast they were, but let's have a look at how evenly they've toasted. So first up, our slow-mo over here, pop it down not too bad actually there's a little bit around the top where it's a bit paler where it was sticking out but otherwise pretty good and I'd say that's a nice medium brown so next up we've got our Russell Hobbs now actually that one's far paler and you can see the top is not browned anywhere near as evenly as the bottom and the jewel it let's have a look say so again that's quite dark brown actually and the top again is not quite browned and that's quite a small piece of bread so all three of them are not toasting evenly right up to the top right so that's how they get on with standard toast let's see how they get on with bagels and crumpets now this is where the jewel it comes into its own it actually has a bagel function that toasts on one side and warms on the other for a perfect bagel so we'll give that a go and then on the others we'll just put in half a bagel and half a crumpet and see how they get on so Again, they're all set on medium, so let's see how they get on. So for me, the worst thing about toasting bagels and crumpets is that awkward moment when you're trying to get them out but you're burning your fingers. So let's see how easy these products are to get out and how evenly they're browned. So first up, our lovely crumpet in the Dualit. Now this has a handy function. Not only can you lift it up during the toast to check how brown it is, but it also comes with a little bonus push so you can get your crumpet out. Now that looks pretty nicely done, a couple of burnt bits, but that's how I like my crumpets. So, And then bagel. Now this has delivered, as it said, this side is warm and soft and the other side is toasted. However, it's not the most even toast you could get. So middle one, Russell Hobbs, let's see. Yep, very easy to get it out. Crumpet, I think it's a little bit more burnt than the first one. And the bagel, also quite crispy. It's quite hard, not much chewiness left in that one. So our cheapest model, still you can pull it up. That's quite pale, probably the least burnt bits, but the bagel is very crispy. Evenly browned, but very crispy. So there you have it. Now, please don't worry about wastage or any of these food-based products going in the bin as our lovely cameraman, Matt, has promised to eat every single one of them, haven't you, Matt? Okay, so let's have a look at the overall results. Now, if it's speed you're after, I would definitely go for the Russell Hops. This toaster comes in various colours. You can get a four slice version and it's the quickest of the bunch. It toasts evenly, but you will need to mess around with the controls a little bit. As you can see, the bagels, it's done quite well and the toast, it didn't do so well. If money is your biggest consideration, then definitely go for the George at Home one from Asda. This is nine pounds in black. It comes in a couple of other colours as they all do and you can even get the four slice version for just 20 pounds it dealt well with everything and it's got a handy little lever so you can get out smaller items so where the jewel it comes into its own is the extra functionality if you're the sort of person that wants your bagel warmed on one side and toasted on the other or you want the ability to be able to pop up the toast mid toast and see how it's getting on then maybe it is worth spending that hundred pounds so really they all do the job it's just up to you how much you're willing to spend I'll be back in the kitchen in two weeks time putting floor mops to the test to reveal the best way to keep your hard floors sparkling clean. 
Hit subscribe now and you'll be the first to be notified when a new episode goes live. Whether you remember mid-century modern style from the first time around or you're a more recent convert, here's our guide to achieving the look on a budget. It's time for the part of the show where we talk interior design with our lovely stylist, Anna Morley. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So the colour wheel is in retirement. I know. So we thought we can't just do this normally, we need a new little pun, something we to do. hang it off. So welcome to Design Deck. See what we've done there? Cards, deck of cards. Over. So Anna, every week I'm going to ask you to pick a card and we will talk about the style you've selected and how to create it on the next show. However, first one, we're going to cheat the deck. So maybe, ooh, you'd like to pick from the top of the deck. Is it about this one? That one. Okay, what's it going oh, to be? What is it? Mid-century modern. I love it. It's a one of my faves, actually. Oh, good. Of all the designs. Good one to start with. Yeah. So, Anna, tell me about mid-century modern style. Okay, so that look popularised back in the 1950s, as the name sort of suggests, was meant to be mass-produced furniture, streamlined for everybody. Gone were the days of this ornate-looking Victorian Baroque style. So it's basically it's functionality furniture but with a massive injection of style. Okay, and the brands like Urkel, Eames, those are the ones we're used to hearing about, aren't they? Exactly, yeah, there's, lo there's actually lots of iconic um, names that were abandoned around and, and there is so many pieces of furniture that instantly you know them as mid-century modern. But obviously, because it's still so popular, they have been reimagined and designers are inspired by the look and it's still being produced and they're still drawing upon the, the look that was created back then that was actually, if I can bore you, Bauhaus style mixed with Scandinavian minimalism and it came together. Wow, you're know, full of facts yeah. today. That's okay. quite unusual for you. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take that. Okay. So I've seen Mad Men, love it. I want to put Absolutely. it everywhere after I've seen Mad Men, but which room should I really be using this style in? Mad Men is quite full on. I mean, obviously they've done it very in keeping and it's gorgeous and uber cool. Um, it's something which I think, yes, you can do that, but it's not to everyone's taste. Whereas this uh, mid-century modern furniture does actually slip into lots of schemes and you don't need loads of it. I would keep it maybe for the living room. That's, that's just where we see it. When we look through the magazine, people use it a lot in their living room dining room if you remember those Laura I don't know um, but you know because of the chairs and again the look you can it just it's also quite a sleek design so perhaps in a bedroom you want it a bit more warm and cozy so perhaps that's where people don't use it as much so I would yeah downstairs living areas so we talked about the furniture, a lot of wood on show. So yeah. what are the colours and patterns that we should be teaming it with? The years that this was being designed, um, it was quite, it come out of quite a um, neutral phase. So they kind of ramped up the colour. So you'll see a palette, I've got some uh, handy samples here. And um, you'll see a palette which has got some kind of lively greens, some teal, navies. You've got your, rust, um, your rusty oranges That's like our sofa and a mustard yellow. Um, so there's kind of, a kind of quite a playful palette and it all went, goes against this kind of tiki walnut woods. So it's actually quite, it's kind of an unusual combination if you're going to use it everywhere. Um, as for um, patterns, they went very stylized, very gra so bold graphics. We have an example here, let me show you. So this is a really nice example. So this is a modern take of a mid-century sort of style. So we've got it's on both sides, which I think is reminiscent of, if you can think of your, your granny's lampshades back in the day, the lime with the fabric lampshades. But this is, a, this is a modern take on it, but it's that, it's that all Achille style feel. So we've talked about colours, so what about um, finishes? So flooring, lighting, what should we be looking for? Okay, so because of all this streamlined wood that's hanging around, um, you want to ramp up the texture so a shag pile rug gives loads and loads of um, comfort and loads of tactility um, glass it was um, if you can again probably think back lots of colored glass so you want to try and inject some of this and leather was used a lot too or you can introduce that to add a bit of comfort now unfortunately a lot of these pieces you can't just get them for 40 quid anymore can you they're very expensive they so have, yeah. if we want to get the look on a budget what can we do okay so we've talked about the colors so you can go and introduce those colors and just and work from that palette so you can in introduce it quite simply uh, you know quite 
cheaply, let's say. You can do some um, accessories, so you can bring in the prints and get some cushions going. That's quite good to do on a budget. Um, or you can go to a store like made.com and they do lots of inspired by mid-century design. So again, you're looking for this sleek look. Um, or you can be very lucky and go to a, some kind of flea market. And you, so you could get lucky and then maybe find a piece that just needs re-upholstering or needs some wood treatment or something. So maybe look for something that somebody else might not be willing to put the effort into. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So if you had to pick one hero piece that just sums up mid-century and would just work in, in a room beautifully, what would you go for? So um, I think it's going to have to be the Urkel sideboard. I think it's just classic, the wooden frontage, the tapered legs, the sort of streamlined handles that you're almost not there. And then, you've, of course, you'd have your, your drinks cabinet inside. Um, but if I wanted to say two, which I don't know whether I'd be able to, but I would say um, one of these low armchairs um, with the with the streamlined um, wooden arms. I think that is a real iconic piece. So yeah, I mean it's very difficult to choose though because there's so many gorgeous, very classic pieces which I think are instantly recognisable. So it's time for our design deck to come out. Um, Anna, would you like to pick the card that we are going yes. to um, focus on next time? Okay, so where should we go? Which one are you going to go for? I'm going to go for this one because it's sort of Tucked speaking away. to me. Oh, okay. Show people at home. Boutique Hotel. Boutique Hotel, lovely. So I love this. Whenever I go yeah. away, I'm literally like, oh, wish I had that you in know, my house. we're taking photos while we're in exactly. there. Exactly, yeah. a little bit of Instagram stuff. Yeah. So join us next time and Anna will be showing you how to bring some five-star style to your home. We've still got our amazing heating giveaway to come, but first, it's time for our tech expert, Verity, to explain why voice assistants are the basis of every smart home. And don't worry, it's guaranteed to be jargon-free. Unless you've been living on another planet, smart speakers are the piece of home technology you're most likely to have heard of. In a nutshell, these are speakers that connect to the internet and contain a voice assistant, like Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. Both Amazon and Google produce their own family of speakers which feature these assistants, but third-party companies like Sonos, Bose and Ultimate Ears also use them in their speakers. But there are others out there as well. Apple uses Siri, the same voice assistant as you'll find in the iPhone, in its HomePod speaker, while Samsung uses one called Bixby in its smart products. If you want to start a smart home setup, you really need a smart speaker to sit at the heart of it. Not only does it allow you to command all of your kit with your voice, but it's also just pretty handy to have. Depending on the services and information you connect it with, your smart speaker can play music, it can check the weather for you, or it can even order you a cab. The beauty of smart speakers is that for how clever they are and all the benefits that they offer, the prices are really very reasonable. Both Google Home Mini and the Amazon Echo Dot start about 50 pounds, with regular sales making them cheaper. While these will work for music playback, they won't offer much by way of audio quality. Something like the larger Echo Plus or the Google Home Max will do a better job, but they will cost considerably more. In terms of getting these installed, most smart speakers are largely plug and play with a quick setup procedure. You'll need to download a free companion app onto your smartphone, and this will help you to get it online and walk you through pairing it with all the other kit and services you might have in your home. The Amazon Echo and the Google Home family of speakers are among the most popular smart speakers for good reason. They're the best and they'll work with the majority of other smart home devices. Apple has the HomePod and it is much more expensive, plus it overall has some catching up to do when it comes to compatibility. But it does sound superb. If you're thinking of investing in any of them, then it may well be worth waiting for the Black Friday sales at the end of November. You can check the Real Homes website for all the latest deals. For more of Verity's great advice on smart homes, head to realhomes.com forward slash technology for her no-nonsense guides and the very best deals. Now, it's the moment you've been waiting for. We've teamed up with Best Heating to give away £1,000 to spend on its entire range of radiators and towel rails. To be in with a chance of winning, simply head to realhomes.com forward slash TV and answer this simple multiple choice question. Which style did we focus on in the design deck section of this episode? You've got until midnight on October 30th to enter, so good luck. Now it's time for me to say goodbye, but join me in two weeks time for advice on converting your loft, tips on creating boutique hotel style on a budget, and the lowdown on smart heating. 
In the meantime, head to realhomes.com forward slash TV for more info on anything we've discussed and don't forget to pick up a copy of our special Christmas living magazine. Happy homemaking!